Chris, thanks so much for joining. Uh, really excited to get your story and to dive into you know how God has really saved you and how he's brought you out of a lot of the new age things that uh, you talked about in the testimony that I saw my friend sent me. And for those who want to see his testimony, it's in two parts. Uh, I'm going to put the links down in the description so you can go to his channel and, and watch his uh, original testimony there that he uploaded. But uh, I really want to dive more into your story. And so thanks so much for, for coming on and, and being willing to share. Yeah, thanks for having me, Everett. It was really cool to see your comment on my video. Uh, I'd seen some of your videos on your channel. And so, yeah, it's really cool to see all the similarities in our journeys and the things that we explored. And I'm just happy to be sharing and getting more of the word out there of, of my testimony and hope that it reaches people who are seeking. Amen. Yeah, no, I'm really excited for our conversation. I think there's so much more that we don't even know that maybe we've shared or we're going to touch on. So uh, if you could just start out by saying, you know, what the beginnings, you know, how you grew up, how you kind of, how it all started for you. Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in East Tennessee in um, just a small town and started going to church at a Methodist church when I was probably seven or eight, somewhere in that time frame. And um, my parents started going around then. My dad had some addiction issues, alcoholism. And it was kind of my mom's search for help with that. And so she wanted to get the family in the church and she ended up, they ended up meeting a guy who had been through Alcoholics Anonymous and he became friends with my dad. And, and that was a really helpful um, blessing in our lives. Um, so I was in, in the church probably until I was about 15 or so. And then I really started to question what, I just questioned a lot of the fundamental pr principles of Christianity around like, does hell exist? Is it fair? How can there be only one way to God? Um, what about all these other people all over the world who maybe are born in a world where they don't have access to a Christian church? And around the same time, my brother and I started to, well, we had internet access probably since I was 10 or 11 years old. And so it was, you know, you start exploring online and you find all this sort of stuff around magic and energy stuff and, um, I think we just started to explore and find that probably a lot of critical voices of Christianity, I'm sure that was a part of it, but also just more of an open sort of internet oriented worldview, um, which was a lot broader than the upbringing I had. And I think that was kind of the beginning of a walk away. Um, and then left and went to college um, in 2004. Uh, and that was really probably the tipping point where I really just started to say, okay, this is, I'm young, you know, I'm free. I, I don't need religion. Basically. I don't need these sort of antiquated views on how, how, uh, what God is or what truth is. And that, that was kind of my, my big step into pride of searching on my own that led into starting to explore into, um, I mean, in the, on the in internet in those days, especially on campus, there was just a lot of file sharing that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. So things like HemiSync, which was like a binaural audio meditation program that a friend mm -hmm. found. And so we'd sit around and listen to this sort of meditative audio and try and get in these sort of um, altered states, altered mental states. Um, I had friends that were exploring with weed and mushrooms. And so I dabbled in that and um, it really just kind of opened me to exploring what the world had to offer in terms of these mystical experiences um, that led into someone recommending like Eckhart Tolle's book, the power of now um, and uh, another Hindu book um, by this guy, Nisargadha Maharaj um, called I am that. Um, and so I met, I met a, like a Hindu professor or teaching assistant and he was like, Oh, you want to come over and meditate with me? And I would go meditate with him from time to time and like sit on his floor in his small apartment. And it was very much an opening of like, Oh, like all these things have some truth in them. Um, I wouldn't say I was overly devoted to any of them, but I was, I'd say mostly open-minded and that led to, I, I graduated from college, uh, lived just a really kind of secular worldly lifestyle in that period. It was a lot of partying and just trying to say trying to fit in, but also trying to do what I whatever I wanted to do, basically. And then that led to getting a really good job after school and in engineering in Austin, Texas. So I went there uh, for a while. Um 
was making great money. I had a lot of friends uh, in that world. And I would just go to yoga classes every now and then. I was still reading kind of self-helpy books. There were a lot of other ones that were kind of in the realm of um, like Tony Robbins um, stuff that's like, how do you sort of build yourself up from within? How do you sort of bootstrap your own life? Um, and so in all that time, I was looking at Christianity, which was just the sort of old school thing that I grew up in. And maybe it had some healthy cultural values, but it wasn't like a true pillar of of truth of, of religion. And um, so about three and a half years into working that job, I had saved up a good amount of money and I was kind of questioning, like, what is the meaning? What is my purpose here? And that led down to this, like seeing like a quarter life crisis counselor. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? And I lay out all these things I'm interested in for her. And Eventually, I move up to um, New York to race sailboats, which is I was on the sailboat racing team in college, and a friend of mine had joined a program up there that was for young people who wanted to learn how to race boats better, like big boats, like 40, 50 foot boats. And so I went up there for the summer and I was looking at how do you apply technology, specifically like sensors and automation software to a sailboat that you're racing. So bringing in all the data on like how the boat's leaning over, the wind speeds, the boat speeds, a bunch of other sensor data. And during that summer, my dad passed away while we were on a big race um, in the middle of the ocean. And that night in the middle of the ocean, I like, I just had this sense of like, I need to call shore. Like I need to call like our shore coaches, but you're not allowed to in these big races. And, um, and over time, the wind kind of died and we were questioning whether we were going to bail out of the race altogether. And so it eventually came up that I was like, yeah, Chris, you should call. And I had the satellite phone. So I call the shore and they're like, Chris, you need to call your mom. Your dad just had a heart attack. And, you know, I'm three days away from getting back to my house, uh, my home where I grew up. And that, I would say, was the beginning of a deep, I'd say sense of being off um and it led down such a deep path of like searching um led to these questions around death around you know mortality um what am i doing in my life what is health and so i went home did the kind of funeral stuff for a couple of weeks and all the things that i thought i needed to do as sort of a guy in the family but i didn't really make a lot of space for like grieving and 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 so then um, I went back to that program and raced sailboats for the rest of the summer and decided not to pursue that career-wise. But then that led me to going to Europe and I was just like, I felt this sense of, I feel off inside, but what do I do about it? And so I started uh, just travel around Europe. We're partying a lot. Me and some friends I grew up with came and the more I pursue these things that seem to be really good in the world's eyes, at least as far as I knew, the more off I felt. And that was kind of the story of the, the following years. It was go see all these amazing places, like party, um, have all these cool experiences. And in the midst of that, I woke up one night in like Turkey while we were traveling around near Cappadocia. And I just had this pain in my heart. And I was just like, well, am I having a heart attack? Like my dad passed of a heart attack. And I was just, it just started to like cause this internal spiraling, I think of like, what's wrong with me? There must be something wrong. Like, why don't I feel good? And um, that pain went away the next day, but it really like caused me to start questioning, like, am I healthy? Like what's going on? And so as an engineer that led me down this path of being like, okay, what, what are like, there must be something off in my like biochemistry. Maybe there's something wrong, like hormonally, maybe there's something wrong. Like I need to take some supplements. Maybe my like neurotransmitters are off. And so I went deep for probably about a year and a half into like, how, how does the brain work? How do neurology work? How do genetics work? And so did like genetic testing, this whole genetic profile, get into like nootropics and this whole world of like brain enhancement. And um, I just try and get any supplements I can find and, and try and tweak the there's a thing called the methylation cycle, which is how your body processes energy. And so I'm thinking I can tweak all of this stuff. And the more that I try and apply those things, the more I feel 
um, volatile, I would say. It might be really great for a couple of days and then down for a week and then be like, what, like how does this system work, this internal system? Mm. And so it's coming from very much like a, a physical place. So it's like all of your experience in my view at that time was about physical mm. functions in the body. It was a very materialist view. Okay. That's so interesting because that's literally how my journey began when I had a health crisis, fractured a vertebrae in my back. Doctors didn't fully know what it was. It was in sports. And, but you know, I had weed in the, in the picture here and I'd smoke cannabis and I would feel the exact place it was. And I told them, this is where it was. My mom demanded an MRI. The slit was right where it was only when I was high on weed. So I'm like the CBDs, cannabinoids, nervous system here. It's en enhancing my nervous system, purely materialistic worldview but the healing journey began there. It yeah. sounds like this is kind of the, the beginnings for you as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that doing all of that led me into this place of like, okay, well, like doing all this online research. And then a lot of people talk about how psychedelics can be used for mental enhancement for healing. Mm -hmm. And so then I started buying some books about that. There's one that was called the psychedelic explorers guide. I think it was, mm. um, I used to work with psychedelics back in the sixties, like in the academic setting before they were banned. And so I started going deeper on that and I'm like, really start to open my mind and be like, okay, maybe I should like really try um, more psychedelics as a way of finding some sort of um, healing, self-actualization, whatever. And then so that- You're very science-based, materialistic, very logical. That was kind of your frame of mind. That was the total frame of mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so in that period, I also went to Burning Man for the first time, which was, you know, big, it's a big music festival in the desert in California. Um, it's known for really crazy art projects. And also there just tends to be a ton of psychedelic drugs there and party drugs mm -hmm. also. But, uh, and so that kind of coincided with like, okay, me thinking, well, maybe I should try some of these things. And then all of a sudden I'm at this place where there's a lot of things like that um, being mm -hmm. offered. And so I had a couple of experiences there, nothing too crazy, but I think what started to happen was I started to open my mind to like, maybe there is some sort of spiritual realm. There is some sort of thing. It was hard to explain some of the experiences I would have on psychedelics in a, in my materialist worldview. I could explain them, but I couldn't, all, I couldn't simultaneously explain them and trust myself. It would, I would have to be take a leap of faith and be like, oh, that something happened, but it has to be just my neurochemistry was, you know, altered mm -hmm. through this substance. And so the following year kind of goes on and I'm still dabbling in that and I'm, I'm working. I have a great job. I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life. And um, I go back to Burning Man the following year. And this year I'm kind of, I've done a lot more study and research on all these things. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm really going to like try and explore myself this year while I was there. And so um, I, I go out and there was this one night where I just felt this longing for truth, longing for healing. And I just kind of looked out and, and I was just kind of tired, tired of myself, I would say, tired of my own suffering in a sense. And so I went out and I bump into this woman who has like this bathtub set up. And there's, there's a lot of people that are so oriented towards healing in some sense in, at Burning Man or self-actualization. And so I get to this bathtub, this woman has set up and she like, it's not, there's no water in it. It's empty. It's so symbolic, but you get in and she hands you this placard and the placard says, um, I give myself permission to feel whatever I need to feel and to basically surrender to like what's here in me or something like that. And when I read that, I just had this intense, um, emotional release. And it was like that night, that was the first night I'd gotten in touch with the grief of my dad's passing. It was like for mm -hmm. these years, I'm trying to do all this stuff and like work harder and, and do more supplements. And I'm and basically just at the end of the day, a lot of it was came down to like, I didn't know how to feel grief. I didn't know how to feel the depth of emotions that um, were happening inside of me in relation to that. And so I lay in that tub and just weep and cry for like 30 minutes. And then I get up and I just like weep the rest of the night. and this was this like at the tail end of an LSD trip. So it was maybe like 12 or 18 hours after, but I, I'm sure there's some um, lingering effects there. But the next day I felt such a load lifted that 
I felt like I felt like this is the path. Psychedelics lead to healing, and I am um, I'm growing in the way that I the, basically the relief I felt from that like cry. I attributed that to the psychedelics, and then I'm like basically full in, full on, um, ready to commit to a sort of psychedelic healing journey. I would say, mm. uh, and. So I, I basically I get back to San Francisco where I'm living at the time. I'd moved there after I got back from Europe and was working in a startup and was just like, all right, like I'm going to like quit my job. I'll sell the house I owned and I'm just going to like focus on seeking. Like it was, there was mm -hmm. something that was so, um, I'd say what I needed in a way, like, and it's funny to look back on and realize I, what I needed was to have emotional awareness of like what was going on inside of me. Um, and yeah, it's, it was crazy. So I, I leave that job and, um, and at the same time, I'm looking at all of this from this perspective of, okay, I need to start a business around this. I can't just fully seek that would almost be, uh, there's probably another layer of the story there, which is like, trying to have sort of material success as a means to finding safety um, in the world, uh, which is another thing that I've found since in faith uh, is that it, it touches so many parts of my life. Um, I try not to ramble too much here. Um, oh, no, I love it. Seriously, go into, go into detail, please. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd say, I'd say for my, for in college, I set some like goals of wanting to be like retired by a certain time and, and not, and a lot of it had to do with not really depending on anyone. It was this sort of mm. desire to be self-sufficient. And I think some of that came from my dad and his upbringing. And so there was this sense that like, I can't really trust anyone. Only I can do this. Mm. And so then when I get to this place of finding some level of emotional resolution, um, I can't just commit to like going down like a healing journey and seeking. I have to kind of like wrap it around. I'll start a business around this. Yeah, yeah, idea. yeah. Did you have a kind of like monastic view of like wanting Excuse to me. isolate, go into nature, really just fully go 100% seek truth, reach enlightenment, like that isolated kind of view? And you were trying to grapple with, hey, I'm making money. I have a degree on this startup. How do I? do this was, and not be a, you know, kind of a weirdo in the, in the societal was, sense. That was the like tightrope I was trying to walk. And so it was like, how do I go down this path and also not be like kind of a hippie spiritual weirdo? Cause I also coming from that sort of scientific materialist view, I'm very kind of judgmental of that world. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking at like, okay, how do, how do we create some sort of technology that can replicate some of these experiences? And so me and a friend got together and decided to um, create some virtual reality experiences for the new virtual reality headsets that were coming out back in like 2015, 2016. And so we looked at how do we um, build meditative experiences that could lead someone towards a deeper internal awareness. And so using biosensors like breathing um, feedback or heart rate feedback or heart rate variability training. And so we're looking at how do you bring all of these, the sensor data into a virtual reality experience that's immersive, that can really get someone in touch with the depths of themselves. And then a lot of that was grounded in, well, how do you know the depths of yourself? It's like, okay, the Buddhists are saying a certain thing. The Hindus are saying a certain thing. Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, it's like, you're, we're all God. It's all God. And so the, the deepest experience of yourself is your, the experience of yourself as God, which is like your self-realization. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, well, how do we apply technology to that? And then in the meantime, while we're doing it, we got to do all this research to learn what is enlightenment. So, so that was kind of the, the excuse or the vessel that I was on that was like helping mm. me to like, or this topic of uh, enlightenment and self-realization. But when and, you had that kind of company, were you an electrical engineer or like a mechanical engineer or what was your study? Mechanical and software. So I studied mechanical engineering, but the first three and a half years I worked in like sensor-based automation engineering. So okay, a company called National Instruments, which builds, they make hardware and software for automating systems and processes, basically pulling oh, nice. their data in. So I worked a lot with automating um, testing of like gas turbines, wind turbines, um, a number of like vehicle systems, braking systems, tire systems. Mm. 
all, all of them have the same similarity of you need to have some sort of sensors out in the world that are measuring pressures and temperatures and forces and uh, voltages and that kind of thing. And you pull it into a software and then you write some software that mm. can integrate mm -hmm. that software, and integrate that sensor data into some sort of logging experience or analysis and automation. So when you had the, the VR headsets and they were trying to get people into that state, were you already like committed to, hey, we don't fully know what enlightenment is, but it's likely getting them into a state that they know they're God. So your yeah. objective was to get pe users of that piece yeah. of technology to realize this Eastern spiritual concept of yeah. enlightenment. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like wow. sad, it's so sad in retrospect, but we would do all sorts of experiments on ourselves with it where we would kind of, um, cause a lot of the Eastern, um, approaches to enlightenment pursue a dissolution of the self or mm -hmm. say that, you know, when the self, when you transcend yourself, you realize that you're God and everything is God. And so we would play around in virtual reality where you have, where you disembody yourself, where you would, you know, essentially like, so you move your arm, but your arm is like 20 feet away from you and it's tied to something else. And so you're sort of um, trying to associate some sort of internal experience of self with something that's external as a means of leading someone towards this realization that it's all you and you are God. And it wasn't as explicit as like what the yeah. Hindus are teaching, but it was sort of, it was a move in that direction. Um, and And we were looking at, pranayama type practices and yoga and various like breath work type practices and thinking if you can automate or train those in um through a breath sensor so we built this breath sensor that would bring your breath your inhales and exhales into the vr experience and so the thought was if you can train someone to have these breath work experiences you'll lead them to some sort of internal um uh experiences of their own oneness, but at, at the minimum, just like help them deal with anxiety and pain. Mm -hmm. And so while we were doing that, we'd go to ayahuasca ceremonies, um, meditation retreats, went to like a couple of meta love and kindness, Buddhist retreats. It's sort of, uh, and you mentioned uh, some actual children's hospitals and such were yeah, integrating I mean, I think, the technology. Yeah. So we, we, um, worked with a couple of clinics, um, on applying the technology to addiction patients, people who are um, struggling with various forms of addiction. Um, we worked with a couple of like labs in like the Northeast that were looking at how do you apply these to different sorts of um, health testing scenarios using virtual reality. And then eventually we got in touch with some people at Stanford Children's Hospital and they wanted to build a sort of meditative app that kids could use to um basically to reduce anxiety as they go into a surgery so mm. pre, pre procedural anxiety relaxing game so the person puts the headset on the kid and then they can tap the outside of it and make it the game more intense mm. so as it gets more intense they can give the kid a shot and um, help them um, basically help the anesthesiologist have an easier job and so the kids go under and they've had a good experience they love the game and so that was that was sort of an area where we had some success. And so while we're having this success at the same time, I'm getting to this deeper place of questioning, like, is this really what I want to be doing? Like this, sure, this is helping kids with anxiety in the emergency room, but like, I want to know what enlightenment is and, and like, you know, how is that value yeah. in comparison to um, people seeking all over the world? And so ultimately we ended up kind of putting that business to the side and just kind of putting it in maintenance mode. Um, because I, in one of those ayahuasca experiences, I had such a dark experience with something that was so terrifying um, that I, after it, I felt so off that I was like, I need to know what's like more about this realm. It was something that was so profoundly dark that um, I felt spiritually off after it. And I also felt like this question of like, what I need, I need more than ever to become enlightened was basically the way I was thinking about it. Um, and then that, at, at that moment, that's when we put the business on pause and it's just like, all right, I'm just going full in on this. Like, and so then mm -hmm. the next two years, I, I basically spent all of my savings on like every possible retreat and workshop and went to India, Thailand, Bali, joined an energy healing school, joined various like, um, 
cathartic emotional release programs and authentic communication and and yeah it was it, that was the beginning of the beginning of the end in some ways the beginning of the end of my search was this willingness to commit everything to it and then yeah and then yeah the rest of the start story goes from there wow so that that i connect so much with that because it was like progressively my desire to go all in because nothing mm -hmm. would reach the same passion level as like finding enlightenment reaching yeah. the truth you know that's the human calling that's the human search every human needs to i just felt no job no anything will beat my desire and my yeah. passion to reach truth yeah and I, that's so, what fueled me too yeah that's it's i mean i think that's you know when people say yeah, everyone has a god-shaped hole in their heart like i think that's part of it you know it's like yeah. what is true like what's beyond life what's beyond self and yeah and like it's I, interesting how like kind of the eastern new age type spirituality when you engage in it it's very much abandon society abandon the mainstream abandon to then yeah. go off and reach this some impose instead of integrate and that being that's one of the most profound things i've realized as i've grown in in the knowledge of the word and you know in the biblical worldview is like living in the truth is a very you know jesus was a carpenter jesus was you know a very much everyday guy and he was God and, and you don't need to go to a mountain and fast for 40 days and have a disciple bring you a bowl of water every 40. It's like these monks I would read about very much integrated into everyday life of a family and work. And, yeah. you know, just that was very profound for me. But continue with what you were saying about uh, that your full on desire was now being channeled. And you mentioned the cathartic release. You can go into that because that's very popular. I did that as well. And the breath work and kind of the emotions yeah. and where your mind was kind of headed on what you thought the cure was, what you thought the solution was. Yeah. So I'll go, I'll go down that, but just another note on what you just said. It was like, I, I became, I've similarly found it's like, wow, you can just have a family and be in life and also like, you know, be continually be sanctified in the Holy spirit and God. And, and um, yeah, and it's so natural and healthy and it's like you don't have to forsake you like all of these good things in your life these good relationships and you know for a period i like was doing these death meditations where you just you kind of you really explicitly allow yourself to die to everything in your life and it was kind of and it put me in this position where i'm like okay i want to be enlightened but then how do you die to like your friends your family yep. like, and like allow yourself to detach from them and and what's so sad and I think is so dangerous in that is those are also the people that care about you the most are the people that can speak into your life. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden these trainings, these teachings are leading you to kind of distance yourself from those people and um, your attachment to them, which is mm -hmm. so sad. And in that same period, I, I became really fascinated with some of the Hindus talk about cities, cities, S-I-D-D-H-I, I think, which is basically the superpowers that you get from spiritual pursuits. And, um, you know, a lot of these stories of guys would be like, oh, he was, you know, he meditated for 40 days straight or like the person died meditating, his soul just left his body. And, and then mm -hmm. this river flooded this place. And all of a sudden this Hindu guru who was meditating by the river, like he's still there buried in the mud because he <sighs> was so purely detached from himself. And I'm like, I look back on that. I'm like, man, who wants, like, you want to just disappear and like sit yeah. and it's just, it's sad. And yeah. Um, so yeah, so that led down this path of, um, I moved into a house with a bunch of, um, tech entrepreneurs at that time who were people who had made their money on like crypto or startup success. And they all, um, basically were on this pursuit of, um, applying technology and psychedelics and Eastern practices to enlightenment, but it was kind of this group of people, eight or nine people living in this house together. And while I was there, it, it became kind of a hub in that area of the Bay where people would come and host workshops and retreats on Taoism and Buddhist meditation techniques and energy healers would come and spiritual energy channelers would come there. And so it, it was very much like put me in touch with all of these different people who seem to have some sort of knowledge and awareness of um, how the spiritual world worked. 
And in one of those days, I um, I was there and this woman came by who was an energy healer and she sat around in this circle and there were people that were kind of like, she would look at them and then she would snap her fingers and she would do something. And then the person would all of a sudden start crying. And I'd be like, well, that's, that's, I was like, I don't believe in that. That's silly. And, um, and I didn't do anything with her that time, but then she was by again, like two months later. And she, I was feeling like, kind of like, I just feel off. I need some help here. And so I, I sort of looked to her and she's like, okay. And she does this thing. And all of a sudden I'm feeling like, all sorts of stuff move inside of me, like internally, like emotional, energetic stuff. And I'm crying. And next thing I know, I'm like, like crying on the floor and the other energy healer woman's there and they're all like snapping and doing all this stuff over me. And I felt some, I don't know, a pseudo relief, but I also felt off after that. But I was like, something's happening here. And these people know something about the spiritual realm that I'm, I'm trying to go deeper into. And, and then it just so happens they're hosting a energy healing school and, you know, you could easily join that for the, you know, short fee of $12,000 a year. And, uh, and so I decide, okay, well, I, these people know, um, they know their way around this world. They're combining and assimilating all this, a bunch of different topics around Buddhism and energy and Tantra and, um, and, um, emotional Release. Kind of a modern approach, a modern psychological kind of scientific energy approach. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't yeah. it was it wasn't fully scientific, but they would try and uh, integrate all sorts of different personality trait studies mm. and um, developmental practices around attachment and um, authenticity and emotional expression and and trauma trauma resolution was another big component of it. Mm. So kind of combining all this stuff that they would ground in some sort of psychological research, but then they would bring in all this other mystical side of it and combine it with meditations on you know, the perspective of um, non-dual reality that you ultimately mm -hmm. just let go of yourself. But then they were trying to sort of bring, they're basically trying to bring all these Eastern perspectives that say detach from yourself and then integrate it with psychology and say, yeah. Like, okay, you're detached, but you're also fully embodied at the same time. And so they're kind of trying to bridge this gap that a lot of people I think face as they go down that path. It's like, okay, I want to be in my body and I want to live in the world, but also, you know, this guru and that guru all say you do these certain things. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were seeing that as like a, a way that they're gifted at um, teaching people how to grow spiritually and, and heal. And in that program, I just, I experienced a lot of really mystical stuff. And, and around that time period is when I really started to be like, okay, there's a soul, like a soul exists. Like there's a thing, there's an immaterial reality that somehow people have some abilities and powers in. Um, I don't necessarily have any sort of powers, but I could see that things happening. I can feel them happening when stuff, when people are, are um, doing these things to me. And um and around that time, I'd also had, so I mentioned that really hard experience with the ayahuasca trip about shortly after that, I had a really, um, intense experience with the DMT. And in that experience, it was just this experience of death and like deep, deep, um, I'd say regret. It was basically the feeling like I'm getting yanked out of my body and I'm never coming back. And it was this feeling of like, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to my mom, my brother, like I'm just gone. And then like 10 minutes later or whatever it is, I'm back. But I'm like, at that point, I was basically, I, I need to stop. Psychedelics aren't helping anymore and they're making it worse. And so I just, I felt pretty off after that. And that was, that was about a month after this really hard ayahuasca experience. And then in that ayahuasca experience, there was this intense sense of like, I'd say spiritual rape in a way it was like this incredible oppression and there's just like this flood of dark imagery around um kind of murder and um abuse and it caused me to really question like was there something that went wrong in my childhood Did, am i repressing mm. something and this memory of my neighbor's house kept coming up and i was like did something happen in my neighbor's house what what is up with that and so that 
you know, moving past that period, I, I stopped taking any psychedelics or going down those journeys, but I felt this kind of internal offness in my spirit and this kind of nagging thought of like my neighbor's house and maybe something's mm. wrong with me, some repressed trauma that I need to work through. And so as I'm getting in touch with this sort of energy healing world, I'm also looking at like, okay, well, you know, a lot of people talk about shadow work, like you're working with your dark side, the, the dark aspects of your personality, and that um, in these worldviews, you can't really, everything is you. And so, and everything is a projection of you. And so if there's some dark experience, that's just something that you need to work through. And it probably means something about your karma and something you need to work on. And so I'm basically taking ownership of some of this dark mm -hmm. material and being like, oh, I need to like work on that. I need to do more meditation. I need to do more yoga. I need to purify my soul in some sense. So you kind of thought that the ayahuasca and the dark experience was a result of something that was being uncovered inside yeah. of you. So then you go on the journey of trying to figure what the heck is that going yeah, exactly. on? Because the doctrine kind of behind bad trips is that, oh, you're not either fully letting go or it's bringing something to the surface that's already been there. And yeah. that's what people are kind of, assuming when they go into it and it's just a full big deception if you genuinely believe that 100 percent totally yeah and so these these women in this energy healing program have the same view it's like the stuff that comes up in these energy healing sessions which is very much you kind of open up to whatever is there and then you start processing it and he's like well was that is that my thing yeah. is that why i'm feeling all this stuff but like where is this coming from mm -hmm. and they would they would call in like spirits from like African shamans into these spaces. Wow. They would like, they would line everyone up and like do this thing where you basically like trigger each person individually, like energetically. And then they go and lay down in this circle and everyone's kind of holding space for you to process whatever's coming up. And mm -hmm. people are like, sometimes like puking. And it's just like this purging kind of experience. And, and some people in that world talk about purging as like this natural response to healing which is like you you literally puke up the whatever some darkness or thing that you're processing mm -hmm. and that's so sad to me in retrospect i'm like i've had these experiences with the lord where i'm like he is so good and so kind and like the healing is not doesn't leave you puking like it's it's like this gentle like back rub that's just like hey it's like i'm here you're good like let me help you like work through this um and so, man, I was, it was just, there was so much deception happening in those spaces. Um, did you ever did come you, in contact with any, uh, like entities and actual beings that you conversed with? I'm sure I did. Um, not so much in conversation at that point, but there were times when I would get some sort of stream of images that I thought was just me growing in some sort of spiritual ability or power. Mm. Um, and I think that was a sort of deception that led to like pro a certain sort of spiritual pride. Um, at, later on in the journey, I did have some experiences with like explicit spirits, um, when I got to, um, well, it was kind of India and then also afterwards at a Vipassana retreat. So I'll get there in a, in a minute. So basically I'd left, I I'm going to that energy healing. It's like basically four days every quarter you go and everyone gets together at this yoga retreat center in, um, in Northern California. And, um, and so all the while I'm going to that, I also joined this other program that's um, it's basically about communication and emotional resolution, but it's the guy sells it as a practice of um, self growth, but also applied to your business. So how do you, how do you apply Buddhist principles to your life and communication in a way that helps you to have more success in the world and in life? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, basically like, can you detach from your own emotions? Can you grow through them? Can you see all the projections of your mind out there in the world? So like Buddhists would talk about this concept of Indra's net, which is like everything is one consciousness. And ultimately all you are ever seeing is the reflections of that one consciousness, which is you, which is everything else. And so they do all this work that's on like reclaiming your projections. So like I, I perceive something in the world and then I claim that as a projection of my mind and then I take ownership of it. And so it, it essentially creates this sense of like, um, I'd say it's in a way, it's a way of training you to become your own God. Like you're saying, oh, well, I'm just projecting this uh, laptop screen is here. And like, you know, it, it doesn't, 
they wouldn't necessarily apply it in such a um, explicit way to like objects in reality, but it'd be like, oh, I'm I'm um, I'm sorry for projecting on you, Everett, that you are this type of person. When in reality, I'm this type of person. So you're always like basically looking at the way your mind is reacting to the world around you, and you're taking ownership of that. Mm -hmm. And so there's some some good aspects of that that lead you to like kind of take responsibility for a certain ways that you might look at the world. But on the other hand, it leads you toward this path of subjectivism and moral relativism, which is like, oh, there's no there's no one truth. It's everyone's just projecting some sort of idea of truth onto the world. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in these workshops, we go through all these different like projection, um, mental projection, reclamation work. And then you'd lay on the floor sometimes and they'd get into like working on projections with your parents, your mom or your dad or anger, like stored anger you have. And it was all based on this sort of tantric views that like when you store anger or emotional stuff, it's stuck in your body and somewhere and you just need to cathartically like let it all out in order mm -hmm. to find healing. And so you'd be in a room laying like on the ground with 20 other people just, and they're all just railing, like just yelling and cursing. And just like, some people are like kind of bubbling at the mouth and you're just like, I look back on it. I'm like, oh man, that is like, it's not healing. <laughs> um, well, I think I think there was a lot of demonic activity in that as well. It's basically, yeah, that's you, open, what... you open up your spirit basically, and you try and feel fully whatever's there. Yeah. Um, and what was so confusing about that was because I think some of those practices do put you in touch with like real um, embodied experience or um, memories from the past. But then what happens is it would get, for me, it would get commingled with all this other spiritual stuff. And so mm -hmm. there's some real grief and pain around my dad passing. And there's also all this other spiritual overlays within that. And so yep. then it, it just feels more and more confusing. Yep. And then you begin to identify with what something that actually could be a spiritual entity inhabiting yep. you and creating an emotion, creating a feeling, infusing it with a current trauma or memory or emotion that that you are experiencing in the moment and then since you take it on it becomes a part of your personality becomes a part of your identity you adopt it as yourself when yeah. really the origin the source of that was not all yourself and another yeah. thing about what you mentioned about the projecting is i feel like it gets people such into an obsession over self-analysis yeah. self-consciousness every thought they're aware of it's like they they it detaches them from everyday life of interacting with other people and, and just, you know, living in a, in a very healthy, peaceful, honestly way. And you become obsessed and hyper analytical and everything's, you know, every thought you're trying to process to then, you know, basically reach enlightenment of fully observing yourself. And then you're never trying to identify with it. And it's like, you're so fixated on your mind and what's going through your mind that yeah. it takes you away from so much that's in life. Yeah. yeah, it builds walls. You you end up being disconnected and that's the it's so sad because the deception is like, oh, you're finding yourself, you're finding enlightenment in reality, you're you're getting further away from the truth of the people around you that love yeah. you, the your you know, your family, your friends. And um it was, you know, you'll you'll know them by their fruits kind of thing in retrospect like probably 90% of the couples in both that energy healing program and the, um, the kind of uh, authentic communication business self-helpy program, both programs had, well, the energy one had maybe 110 people in it. The self-helpy one had probably 30, maybe 40. Um, I think 90% of the couples in those programs split up during wow. those like 18 months. And like some people were married, some people were like long-term relationships. And because it, it sort of plants this virus in your mind, it's like you need to you need to be pursuing enlightenment, and you need Self. to be attached. It's all about you and yourself. And if and if you're committed to another person or anything, oh. but that's ultimately taking away from your enlightenment. Like yep. That's taking away because that's just an attachment that you are you're basically anchoring yourself. And then they become an object of your enlightenment to teach you something, or they're there to help you. They're exactly. there to help your soul ascend and reach enlightenment and break karmic. They're basically a vessel just for your own good. There's actually exactly. no genuine, pure, selfless love in that perspective. And it's adopted unconsciously many times. People don't understand that they're actually thinking that way, you know? Yeah, exactly.
And so, so all these people start to get to be like, oh, maybe I need to explore polyamory. Maybe I just need to like, you know, work with other people to like find enlightenment yeah. or maybe, you know, because it's not perfect with this person I'm with, like there's probably some spiritual baggage and it, it was, it's sad. It's sad to look back on these people that had, I think, healthier relationships and ended up in a worse place yeah. because of that. Um, and so I'm in those programs in that time period. And um, I also start, um, I'd say in terms of entities, I, I, before entities, there was just this experience of energies where yep. I would start to, I start to read about like um, energy channeling and crystals. And so I'd buy some crystals and think, oh, I need to get this black crystal that's going to ground my root chakra to help me to like balance out these energies. And I'll mm -hmm. get this, you know, these other types of crystals and they have these various spiritual powers. And, and then you read these books. I would read these books about um, channeling where people would open themselves up to a spirit and they would write something and the spirit would be talking about the different chakras and how they work and the energy mm -hmm. centers. And, um, and so I'm, I'd start having these experiences. I'd like wake up in the middle of the night and this is one of them where I'd, I would feel like there was a presence around me in some way, but it was like, oh, this presence is healing me. It's helping me in some way. And so it would be like, I would feel some sort of energies moving and then the presence would kind of flash off and disappear. And I'd be like, oh, there's some sort of spirit beings that are helping me to like heal and find enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And, um, wow. and there was just, yeah, there was there were moments where I would just wake up and I'd feel so confused and disoriented and it'd be like, Oh, there's, and, and I would, it would, they would be leading me more down this path of viewing no self and detachment as the path to truth. So I'd have experiences that were validating those yeah. things that I was reading in various gurus and, and Buddhist writings. And the evidence for their actual existence was very clear and not just some kind of mental you know, mental imagination to help maybe this journey or some placebo type suggestion to help, you know, where they're assisting, you know, there's actual real physical manifestations of these beings, real yeah. actual, like, you know, dynamics that are observable and not just yeah. like some singular person's mind kind of projecting yeah. it. And then you start yeah. realizing all that's real and then you want to come in contact with them, right? Yeah, you, you realize there's some sort of spiritual power here and maybe it's benevolent. It's helping me out to grow spiritually, to reduce my like karmic baggage or load that's, you know, holding me, you know, in this reincarnation cycle. Mm -hmm. And then one morning I woke up and um, had this, it was right after a eight day silent Buddhist meditation retreat. I got home and I was kind of having a lot of really weird mystical experiences. And I woke up and I just read this book about, um, by this guy, Adi Ashanti, who's a, a Westerner who goes down this um, Buddhist path and becomes quote unquote enlightened. And he's writing all these books where he's, it's about coming to the end of yourself, basically that when you die and you're basically letting go of everything, but you're basically dead, but you're still here, you're walking around, you're like totally surrendered to everything. And, uh, and so I, I have this experience one morning, I wake up and I'm just like, I'm dying of death. Like, it's like this experience of like the death of myself in some way. And so then I get up and like, I walk outside and it's like, literally it feels like I'm disconnected from my body and I'm looking at all this stuff and it's like, it's real, but it's not actually real. It's there, but it's not actually there. Mm. And it's in incredibly ungrounding um, from myself and my soul and who mm -hmm. I am was then. Um, so I keep, keep going down that path and I'm having all these experiences and I think it means that I'm growing deeply and uh, spiritually. And, and um, I uh, meet some people who talk about like Bali and Thailand and India as this sort of spiritual journeys that they've been on there. And there's these hubs in like Ubud, Bali, where all sorts of people go to do um, various types of trainings. And it's, there's all sorts of like healthy cafes and restaurants and everyone's kind of they're doing yoga workshops and yoga teacher trainings and Buddhist uh, retreats. Yeah. It's like a new age Mecca. I went there too. Yeah. Unique. And so there's like, and they talk about these healers, like the, um, was it eat, pray, love talks about these healers that she goes and sees there that do various things. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go there. I'm going to find these healers and tarot card readers and like, see what they can, you know, add to my spiritual experience. Um, yeah, it's cool. It's cool that you went there also. So 
you were that was was I my little moped i was going all around the island <laughs> yeah i would just like drive my moped around i'd go to like a authentic relating workshop where you like communicate like you just focus on communicating whatever's there with you in that moment so you're just totally giving voice to whatever feelings you're having in the moment mm. and you're creating a space where everyone who just sits there and they just share what exactly what they're feeling and and then you sort of assume that it's leading towards some sort of deeper healing uh, or truth experience. Yeah. And uh, and then yeah, went to yoga workshops, went to a bunch of healers there, and like had some saw some profound stuff, like profound in the sense of mystical. I wouldn't say it was all that helpful, but um, it was it was crazy. I went to a tarot card reader, and and um, she said a bunch of stuff about me and about my family that was pretty spot on or at least like close mm -hmm. and i was just like, wow this person has power and um but she also said some stuff about jesus in it and i was just like oh what, what and and there were a couple other times with the energy healer woman where jesus would come up while she was just kind of giving voice to these images that she's getting and and um and so it's interesting to look back and see these moments where Jesus would come up in these kind of mystical experiences, but I would always write it off and kind of put it to the side and be like, oh, Jesus is, you know, the same as Buddha and yeah. Atsu. And Ascended and, master or something. Yeah. And it was like, oh, is this just, you know, he somehow relates to me because I'm come from a Western world. And so he's the guru that I need to be following in some mm. way. Um, and so, so I'm in Bali, I'm kind of just going to every possible workshop I can go to. Um, and at the same time, I'm just going deeper into, this is four years after my dad passed, but I'm going deeper into grief um, and just have lots of moments where I'm really like, just, I'd say actually getting in touch with a depth of like, um, I'd say missing my dad and uh, pain around various things that he did or fights that we had or whatever, and things that I, I was struggling to let go of. And so in that period, I was also reading a book called A Course in Miracles. And have you heard of this one? Yeah, that's a big one. And so it's it's so sad, such a sad book, but uh, you know, it's written by this woman who apparently channels this book by Jesus, this spirit entity that claims it's Jesus. And it basically espouses a lot of basically it's Hindu new age belief just wrapped in like Jesus, Jesus's name basically. And it's, um, and so I'm reading that and I'm thinking it's all about, about Christ like, consciousness. Yeah. 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 Which is basically what they would say is like the same thing as like, um, Buddha nature or, um, your true nature in a lot of the Eastern and new age worlds. Yeah. Um, and so I'm reading that and it starts to like, for whatever reason, it does make me think more about Jesus. And I start to think about like forgiveness and, and prayer and not in a way that was really related to the book, but it did. I think there was this kind of compulsion in me to be like, I should maybe it's like, I'm applying all these other things, meditation, yoga retreats, energy, healing, crystals, all this stuff. I might as well start praying also. And like asking for forgiveness, like trying to forgive others who have wronged me in some way in my life. And so I come back home after Bali and I visit my mom and the property that I grew up on. And I just go visit all these places where my dad used to like hunt and work on with his tools and the tool shed and stuff. And I was just, I would sit there and I would try and make this little film, trying to like, it's like a creative project to work through my grief. And, um, while I would sit there, I would just weep. I would just cry. And it was just like this sense of being kind of lost and alone and like sad about his passing. And then one evening, um, no one was around. I was totally alone. And I just went to the house and I just laid on the bed and just cried. And it was like this depth of, um, I think, allowing myself to feel the true sadness that was there. And it was like there was this this kind of fatherly love that came in and it just felt like held me in this place of like, like, I don't know, just fatherly love. That's the way it felt. And, and from that moment on the grief that I had about my dad was, was diminished. It was like the sense of like, he was, he was imperfect. He was broken. He was, um, 
you know, just another human and he loved me and he tried his best. But from that moment, there was this sense of like, there's a fatherly love that's bigger. And that was, that was all I thought of it. Mm. Um, and so I also go to Thailand at that time and, um, um, what's it, Kopangan, which is another sort of Mecca of spiritual healing and it's interesting that that experience was like a father's love because in most of those spiritualities, it's always a mother's love, a mother Gaia, a mother earth, you know, a motherly yeah. embrace. I feel like that, that, uh, the feminine is worshiped in that loving way. And the masculine yeah. is always like a strength, power, strong, but you had a, an experience very like, you know, in terms of the biblical view of the heavenly father and, and Jesus Christ, the son and like, I, I didn't really experience too much of a, a fatherly, godly archetype in new age spirituality. It's not really there that much. Yeah, I wouldn't. That's a good point. I haven't really thought about that. I think I look back on it. I'm like, oh, that was that was the father, the father's love, like um, revealing himself in some way to me. And it was like, uh, and it was so sweet, so kind. And so, you know, there wasn't catharsis around that it was like it was it was uh peaceful mm -hmm. and, and that like in retrospect i look back at all these experiences around catharsis and energy healing and letting go and feeling all this stuff and it wasn't peaceful it was it always led to more work it yeah. led to a certain sort of anxiety and confusion afterwards very dramatic too people shaking yeah. kundalini that's when i did it kundalini yoga the breath yeah, work, exactly. the Wim Hof stuff. I actually saw a guy pass out. Ambulance came at Wim Hof in San Jose, California. One of his events, like it's a very, it's, it's sketchy. It's not peaceful. Yeah, it's not. I did a bunch of those breath work workshops also. Where you, you're breathing, you're hyperventilating basically yeah. on the floor and then people are laying there and they're like, you know, moving their body in all sorts of ways. And uh, yeah, and I mean, just another note on another thing I was trying then there was this group called inner dance that was based in thailand where they're basically this guy went and lived on an island for two years by himself on his pursuit of spiritual enlightenment and he he told this story about how he stopped eating and drinking so he's like basically pursuing kind of breatharianism he said he didn't eat or drink for 40 days or something like that and he tells a story about his enlightened enlightenment experience where he's like in this kind of tree house where he's living and all of a sudden this like entity, the spirit comes and literally like throws him out of this tree house. And he's like lands on the ground. And he's, he's talking about this as if it's like this enlightenment experience. And in retrospect, I'm like, oh, it wasn't what you thought it was. Um, but then he basically has this moment where he realizes that there's some sort of experience that he can imbue in music and he calls it inner dance. And so he would mix music in a certain way where he would slow down the timing and make it kind of the the beat would be uh, consistent and then it would like slowly open up and so it's basically creating this space where people um open themselves up using music to feel whatever they need to feel basically and um and so you're on a room with a bunch of people like laying on the floor and they're playing these musics this music and people start to have that same sort of things, cathartic experiences and they're cringing and flexing their backs and saying stuff or moving their hands in all sorts of ways. And um, yeah, it's just, I think in retrospect, I look at all these practices, like you, you open yourself up and then you allow yourself to feel whatever feeling is there, but you're also allowing the sort of guidance and um, um, not blessing, a sort of pursuit of this other person to imbue this experience with some sort of meaning um and then you're also sometimes calling on some other practice taking refuge in the buddha taking opening yourself up asking you know healing spirits to come in or whatever it is and it's just opening doors it's crazy and it's very rare almost if ever that there's someone who is a genuine you know believer in christ as the savior as god in one of those places and proclaiming that to anybody in conversation you yeah, proclaim that I mean, and the spirits involved in healing and stuff there's a strong aggression against the, the timeless truth 
of Jesus Christ as God, as Savior, as yeah, Messiah, you know? Yeah, it's it's either aggression or immediate, like, reattribution. Oh, yeah, he's, you know, I believe in Christ consciousness. That's mm -hmm. good, you know? Like, Jesus is, you know, he's great. Love that guy. So yeah. basically the same thing as the Buddha and, and the, you know, Ramana Maharshi. And, like, it's like immediately Jesus turns into, like, Christ consciousness. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's it's crazy. Um so anyway, those those few months passed. Um, after all that, I start kind of I have this experience around grieving my dad, and I also kind of get to this point where I'm. I guess I didn't mention this, but I had gone to a couple of Sadhguru retreats. Sadhguru is a big, a famous kind of Indian mystic. Now oh, I watched so much of Sadhguru. He had all the crazy stories too, where he's sitting in a village for forty days meditating with like, you know, I forget how many days it was, no food, no water, and people were all surrounding him and everything. And I'm like, whoa, this guy's a legend with powers. Like, I want yeah. these powers. Yeah, and I, same. And, he, and he, he does such good marketing of his stuff online where it's like he seems like such a charismatic, like happy-go-lucky guy. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to a retreat with him at it, and like I look at him and it literally, he wasn't nearly the like this charismatic, happy guy that he comes off of as the marketing in these YouTube videos. Like yeah. he was kind of grumpy and like a little harsh and like wouldn't really, wasn't really like kindly connecting with anyone. And, um, mm. and in this retreat, he does this thing where he like does this blessing over the whole group. And um, there's this moment where he talks about like Sadhguru talks about using black magic to like help people and heal people. Wow. Like it's, I never heard about that publicly on his videos and such. Yeah, in his videos, he talks about it, some one or another. And, uh -huh. and then he's like, it's crazy to look back on it because he, he'll go to these, you know, he's he's known for working with snakes. He talks a lot about snakes and how snakes are these his friend and how he like learned how to handle snakes and how he, he'll bring snakes into these sort of yoga practices. And you'll there's a couple of videos where he's there and like snakes are, you know, circling around him. And he's picking them up. And I'm just like, oh, man, this guy's, what is it? Not, not that there's anything wrong with the animal of a snake, but it's interesting that he's combining this spiritual pursuit and a snake is kind of the icon that represents, you know, Kundalini for one in Hindu yoga. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and then a lot of his uh, materials, he'll use snakes in the, um, iconography of it. Um, so what was I saying? So anyway, I, I go to this retreat and he does this thing where it, I think he's sort of applying this blessing and he like does this, like lifts up. And I literally, it's like, I look at him and I feel like his body is like, like his spirit is gone, like not there. Like it's, it's like some other being, being, wow. there. And I was just, I, it was, it was a really weird moment. And that was in and, your perspective at the time, not now looking back. At the time, it was like, there's something strange happening here. Wow. And, it was crazy. Um, so then I, but I think though, I'm going to go to his, you know, cause he talks so much about his ashram and how powerful it is and the, the Diana Linga and the, um, the Linga Bavari, which is like this statue of Shiva's. Um, it's like a, um, basically a statue of Shiva's <laughs> trying to find a way to say this. What do you call a, basically his penis. Um, it's like, a phallic statue basically okay, and it sits a phallic in symbol moment. it's a phallic symbol of shiva and it's in this big dome and he apparently like he talks about these stories about how Sadhguru almost died like while he was consecrating this space because he's putting so much of his soul and his spiritual effort into like imbuing this place with spiritual power and so he, um wow. so i'm like oh I, I have to go to this place i have to go see what this is like and um i had also heard that um, uh, Pacha Karma, which is a type of Ayurvedic cleanse, was a really powerful spiritual tool. And so I signed up for this three-week Ayurvedic cleanse where you go and stay at this retreat center in southern India, and they're like providing you with certain foods that map to the Ayurvedic perspective on Vata and Pitta and the various energies of, of your body. And uh, every day you're getting like these sesame oil massages, and they're dripping this milk substance on your third eye to try and open it up and like those, yeah the oil so yeah. much oil poured right on my third eye connected to my i think i was like somewhat pitta and the whole ayurvedic beliefs yeah. yeah so i'm there for three weeks and and so at this point i'm years into this search 
um, the seeking, I keep feeling like I'm finding, but all of a sudden I'm like doing more and more work and I'm feeling more confused and more lost. So when I get to this Pachakarma cleanse, I'm like doing two to three hours of meditation a day, three hours of yoga a day, doing this Kriya yoga from Sadhguru, doing this um, mantra yoga that someone else had given me. And I'm like applying crystals. I'm like, I'm like, all of this stuff has to work. Like it's got to start work. Like I'm fully yeah. in, but it's a full-time job. It's, you know, six to eight hours a day of work. And then in the off time, I'm like reading about various gurus or Mahal Maharshi or um, Yogananda and uh, various other kind of mystics, Sadhguru. And um, well, in that period, it starts to feel really kind of, mystical. Um, and at the same time, I would sit down, I would, I would start to do these practices. And oftentimes later in the evening, I would sit down and I would just kind of do this mantra practice. And, um, and then after that, I started kind of, like I said earlier, I was like throwing prayer and forgiveness into the midst of all this. So it's like, it's literally everything that I came across. I'm just try it basically. And so I start praying and I just start, I think I was, I was much more inclined initially to like forgive everyone else, forgive all the people that had hurt me. So that I wouldn't have the attachment to that so that I could move past it. Mm -hmm. And there was this night there at that Pachacama where I started to ask for forgiveness for the thing, for myself. And I started to, um, I say recognize that I needed help. Like it was this moment of like, none of this stuff is really working. I'm doing more and more and more, and I need to let go of something. I need wow. to like, have, I need to have some sort of healing. Um, and then it just like, it started to like, there was these moments of a meeting point, like meeting point with God, I would say in retrospect. Um, and at the same time, I'm doing all this other stuff. So it's still kind of confusing, but there's something true that's emerging in that. And, um, and then one night I'm up um, meditating. Like if I couldn't sleep, I would just get up and meditate for two hours or something like that. And I'm meditating on like uh, watching, being aware of all of my thoughts, all the impressions, all the things. And I, and I feel like over this time, I feel like I'm getting more and more detached from myself um, and my thoughts. And, and it comes to this moment in the middle of this night where I feel like I'm kind of like being blasted up and it feels similar to it was maybe related to that DMT experience, maybe not, I don't know, but there's this feeling of like being blasted up, like away from my soul. And it was like this moment of like, to move forward, I needed to like, let go of my soul. Mm. And I was like, I don't, I don't, there was like this knowledge or maybe just an inclination in me to be like, I don't think I should do that. Like, mm. I don't think I should let go of my soul. And, um, and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm like, even if that's the path, I'm not doing that. It was this weird kind of sense of discernment, I would say. Um, and so things start to get just, I have more experiences like that over the next couple of days. And then I get to, um, I get to Sadhguru's ashram, like two days after that, maybe three. And I'm in that dialing. And on the way there, I have this impression, and it's like a, spiritual image comes into my mind's eye of the road leading to this ashram. It doesn't have like a sense of like love or peace in it. It's just like this intense kind of image of the road going to Sadhguru's ashram. Mm. And I was like, oh, that must mean, I, I think I wanted it to mean that I was on the right path. And at the same time, there were a bunch of these kind of spiritual images that were being, I'd say, imposed into my mind. And I also felt like a certain sort of terror and franticness around it. And so... Um, I go there and I go and check in and then I sit, go to sit in this, the Diana Linga area where the um, phallic statue is. And I sit there and um, I think because of that sort of asking for forgiveness, it felt like there was something in that. I, so I sat there and I just prayed and I asked for forgiveness and um, forgiveness for what? what? Like your wrongdoings? Immorality? Well, I would say yeah, I would go, I would go through like things that I had done in my life that I felt were wrong um or bad in some way um mm. and uh and there was just this moment where like this this profound peace comes over me and it was just like it was like 
touched my heart. And it was like this moment of like, Jesus, it was just like in my heart, there was this sense that's Jesus. Wow. And like, I don't, it's like profound. It was like a supernatural Jesus. And I was just like, Jesus. And it was like this sense of like here in like India and in this ashram. Wow. And, and, and that the way it touched me, it was like the way he like spoke, it was like, you're loved. You've always been loved. And it was just, it was just the, it's hard to explain. It's like the, the power and the truth of it was like, it was so true and so real and so peaceful that I just started weeping and I just wept for an hour just sitting there. And then it was like, and the other thing that I kind of heard in it was like, read the Bible. Wow. And so all this, this whole like three years or whatever it had been at that point, I'd been doing all this stuff, but I was so reluctant to read the Bible. I was so reluctant to even like pick it up, to think about it, to consider it. Mm. It was like, it was off the radar. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, read the Bible. It's like, oh, okay. So I download like the Bible app on my phone. Wow. And I go back to I go back to the um, place where I was staying and I just lay there and I start reading the Bible and I'm just like, this is interesting. And I'm, it wasn't like profound, but it was like this sense of like, there's, there's wisdom here. And, um, so this then I that, leave. This is that, uh, his top ashram. Sadhguru's like top yeah, pinnacle in, of like his spiritual place. Yeah. In Coimbatore. Wow. Yeah. Coimbatore, India. That's incredible. And so, yeah. The, the king goes where he wants. <laughs> he goes where he wants. Um, so I leave that place and I go to Osho's ashram, which is Osho. You familiar with him? TM meditation. Um, I don't. I mean, he might use transcendental, but he Osho was he this had mystic. the place in the U.S. I watched the documentary on him. I never got yeah. too into his stuff, but he had a lot of books and things about him in the New Age when I was there. Yeah, exactly. So he, some people at Burning Man actually had recommended his ashram in India, and. Um, he very much integrates a lot of this sort of psychological stuff um, with cathartic release and tantric practices with um, with a lot of other Eastern practices. Mm. Um, he he combines all of them and writes a ton of books, wrote a ton of books before he passed about how all of these different religions are saying the same thing. So he would bring Sufi mystic practices in and... Um, shamanistic practices and he would try and bring in like uh, christian practices like speaking in tongues and um so in his ashram there's all these different places that are kind of devoted to these different prophetic teachers um mm. so there's like little monuments to buddha and lao tzu and um, confucius and various maharshi uh, i think there's there's just a bunch of different mystics and gurus and so and and he basically takes verbiage from all these different practices, and then kind of contorts it into whatever he wants it to say. Um, and so um, I get there, and I had signed up for this program like four months before. It was called the Born Again Program. And so it was, it was taking a sort of Born Again terminology from Christians, but it was applying it to um, how do you find your inner child? Mm. Like, because enlightenment leads you to be more like a child. And um, was this an Osho thing? It was an Osho thing. Yeah. Okay. And so I get there and they're like, oh, you're here for the born again program. And this is like two days after I'd had this experience. With oh, Jesus, my. So. And I was like, yeah. And um, and then they're like, oh, you're going to be in the Jesus dorm. So there's a dorm named after Jesus. And so I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, you're in room number three. And I'm like, I'm dwelling on the thoughts of the Trinity. And what does that mean? And it's like, wow. And then they pick up my passport and my name's Chris or Christopher. And so they like, they see it and they're like, oh, Christ. And I was just like, it was just like back to back to back things. It was just like, Jesus, and You had Jesus, just Jesus. downloaded the Bible app. Two days before. Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Praise yeah, God. It was, it was crazy. And it was just like this, it was this moment of this kind of mystical walk for the next two, two or three weeks where I'm just like, something's happening here and I'm opening up to God and I'm asking, I'm praying. I start to like authentically pray. And at the same time, I'm in the midst of probably one of the most spiritually dense, deceptive kind of places I could be. And so I get there and I'm like, um, 
I go check into the, that room and I start to go to these born again program classes. And then in the classes you get there for in the morning, it's like two hours or something. And in that you just kind of tune into yourself and you tap into wherever there's an authentic desire and you just, and there's, there's no talking. Um, you're in a room with maybe 15 other people and there's games and stuff laying around. So you could just play with stuff. You can run around, you can yell, you can scream. It's about creating a place for your inner child to come out and play. And so while I'm doing that, it's just, I would, I would lay on the floor and I, I would see like the crucifix, like in my body, like I would, the, the, the authentic desire that I would follow in my body would lead me to like lay on the ground with my arms and like a crucifix. Wow. And I would just feel like, this is, this isn't that playful. I mean, you know, it was like a, but it was like this internal compulsion to do that. And, um, and, but it wasn't like, um, harsh, I would say it was just, I'm doing the thing, whatever the thing that I want to do is. And, um, and I even saw like a couple of other people that were in the room that were following their thing. And I would see them do a similar shape. And I was just like, why? Cause I'm thinking about Jesus. I'm thinking about God. And there's all of a sudden there's these crucifix types positions coming up. And then in the mornings you'd go to this like 6 AM workshop where everyone would come and, um, basically part of Osho's practice would be like you, you cathartically let out all of the energies and the things in you. So for 10 minutes, you just stand in this room and scream and yeah. yell and laugh or cry or whatever you got to do. And then the next 10 minutes you would sit and just be completely limp, just let your body rest. And so I would do that in the morning, like right after this. And then all of a sudden my body, my arms would want to come up again. And it would just be like this crucifix shape. And I'm just like, I'm trying to just let my body do whatever it wants to do, but it was just like this, my arms would just raise up and it would just be like, and so I'm standing there just like, I look like an idiot, but I also am trying to be most authentic to my own mm -hmm. internal experience. And it was just day after day that happened like multiple days in a row. And, and I'm just like, okay, like something's happening here with God and it's profound. And it's also like kind um, and there was just a number of other things. And it was like, it was like, I was being shown some, <clears throat> some level of discernment in that moment where I'd talk to one person. I'd be like, Hey, I'm having this experience with Jesus. And like, I think it's actually, like might be true. Like what he, like what he says about like being the way and the person would like immediately like downplay it. Or it was like, but it was wow. what I would see is almost, almost like a sense of like darkness come over them. It was like in my mind's eye or wow. in, in like the and it was like, wow. And it would just have this sense of don't talk to them. Don't go down that path. And they'd be like, oh, you should pick up um, Osho's book on Jesus is in the library down the street. And I'd be like, no, I'm good. Uh, that's it was like, I knew not, that was not the path to go down. And, um, and then I talked to someone else and it would just feel like the spirit was just being like, Hey, like, listen, this, this is, this is okay. It was like, it was kind of an opening. Um, and so I just, that week, I'm just like reading the Bible. I'm going to all this stuff. And at the same time, and I, so I go to a, a, an energy healing kind of session and this woman's doing this stuff and moving energy or whatever she does. And she's like, really like, it feels like your second chakra was blocked. And so in the, in that worldview, they say the second chakra is tied to like desire and sexual expression. And so she's like, you just need to, you need to find someone, um, you know, a partner or girlfriend or whatever. And um, you need to have a lot of sex. And I was just like, <laughs> and it was like another moment where in my spirit, I'm just like, mm, nope, that's not what I need. I don't need to do that. And there were just multiple other moments that week where it's like someone was saying something, but there was this internal check that was coming in. It was like, no, nope, don't, no, nope, not that, not that, not that. And, um, and so I'm leaning into that and I'm feeling ultimately pretty confused because I'm there and I'm having this experience and I'm all these people are saying things, but there's this deeper sense of conviction in me that it's not the right thing. And, um, I go on this one walk one morning, afternoon, something like that. And I'm just praying. And I'm like, God, like I'm, I started to read about sin. And I'm like, God, how does sin exist? How does it work? I was just like, why is it like this? Um, I was thinking about the 10 commandments and, um, I'm walking down this path and I was just like, God, like, and I see this kind of square tablet, uh, not a tablet, it reminded, it reminded me of a tablet. It was like a concrete paper and it was halfway sunk in the earth. 
And I was like, God, like you're, if you're all powerful, like you could make that into the Ten Commandments right now. I was like, <clears throat> but would that be a sin for me to ask you to do that, to prove yourself to me? And so I'm dwelling on this as I'm kind of prayer walking through it. And I was like, go to lift it up. And I was like, I was like, I don't know, God, but I'm going to lift it up anyway or whatever. And I'd start lift up this stone and under it is like a green coiled up snake, just like parked under this rock. And I was just like, okay, that's okay. Maybe it's, maybe it's a sin to ask God to prove himself to me in this, in this way that's about me. Um, and uh, there's just a number of crazy other stories. Just, it was, it was wild. Um, this is all in the span of like how long? From when you downloaded the app, you had that experience of Father's Love to like now? The Father's Love was about a month before India. The experience with Jesus was while I was in India after wow. like three weeks of Mantra Karma. And then. Oh, yeah, the experience the with Jesus. Okay. And so it was like Father, Jesus, Bible. And then it was just like a bunch of stuff all at one time within like two or three weeks after wow. that. Wow. And so I get back home after that and I go back to this energy healing retreat. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm onto something, but I'm like, I'm not to the point where I'm like, Jesus is the only way I'm like, yeah. Jesus is like profound and mystical and true. And so I get to this, um, back to this energy healing thing. And I'm like, wow, like Jesus, I'm trying to tell everybody about Jesus. It's not, it's not exactly grounded in Jesus of the Bible, but it's like, it's about the sort of profound, some sort of profound experience that I had in India related to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And people are, you know, very supportive because I'm not saying that I'm Christian or anything. It's like Christ, <laughs> everyone's like Christ consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And so I leave that retreat and I go and I just go back to my house. And I'm like, okay, I like, I need to figure out how does Jesus relate to all these other paths that I've been on? He has to be saying the same thing. All these paths have to be going to the same place, this sort of perennial perspective, like all the paths lead up the same mountain and at mm -hmm. the top is the same, the same peak. And so I spent like a couple of months just trying to sit and journal and process all this stuff that had happened. And I, um, I, for whatever reason, I get this kind of inclination. I was like, I should go to another Buddhist meditation retreat. And so this Vipassana had come up and a friend had invited me and I was like, oh, okay, I'll go to that. And uh, I go to this retreat and Vipassana is a 10 day silent retreat. You turn in your phone, your laptop, everything. You don't make eye contact with people. They serve you a couple meals a day. And you're just meant to sit for six to eight hours a day in silence doing this body scanning meditation where you scan your body and you repeat a couple of phrases. And um, so I'm doing that. And about four days into this um, retreat, I just have this moment where I look down and I feel like there's a presence that's um with me but is not me and it's it's like i can feel some sort of presence that's there and and i'm sort of leaning into that i'm like this must be some aspect of my consciousness or my being or my spirit or something and and then this image comes back up from years before of my neighbor's house and i'm just like what what like, why is that coming up now and and then in that moment, I remember that when I was like six or seven years old, my neighbors, the two girls that lived there, they went into their parents' closet and they brought out a game, which is a Ouija board. And we played with this Ouija board when I was like at the neighbor's house when I was six or seven years old, however old it was. And and I remembered in that moment that I played with that. Wow. And at the same time, all of a sudden, I was with an evil spirit. And it was like this there was this kind of simultaneous realization that there was a door that was open. There was some sort of contract that was made, whatever it was that allowed this spirit to be there. And it was like all hell broke loose. Like literally it was like all of a sudden, like there's streams of images coming into my mind. I haven't done psychedelics for a long time at this point. And, and it's just images of, basically like this thing wanting me to feel like I was in chains, like basically like it owned me. And then, um, and then it would, the more I would kind of resist that or be like, no. And I would try and imagine this image of the cross. That was like my way of trying to relate to it at that moment. Cause I would also like try to apply all these Buddhist practices and yoga practices. I just need to move the energy a certain way. I need to um, detach or love this 
this presence and this awareness and be image after image of like, it would be like, imagine you close your eyes and you're standing on a cliff and you're being asked to jump mm -hmm. or not even asked, you're being kind of pressured into jumping, like take a step, jump off the cliff. And so it's a lot of like suicidal type of images. And I'm just like, I don't, I'm not suicidal. This is not, this is not me, but over and over and over and over. And, um, and so then I go to bed that night and I'm like, okay, just meditate with this. And then I wake up in the middle of the night and it's just gruesome images after images after images. I get up the next day, I keep meditating. I'm like, okay, it'll, you know, eventually I'll, I'll beat this thing or whatever. And I'm just meditate on it and do the things. And then it's like, starts to get more intense, like energetically. And I'm starting to feel like more disconnected, I'd say from my body. And, um, and I start to just like, it's just, I'm not sleeping well. And I do it again the next day and like days in, it just turns into, it's like this portal is opening up and I'm like, it, it feels like literally I'm seeing into hell and it's like, there's these gargoyle esque creatures and they, they have these chains that come up and it wants me to believe that they're like hooked into my flesh and I'm being yanked down into hell. And there's this sense of like, it's going down. It was like, there's nothing I could do. And of all, I'm all my internal might. I'm struggling against it. I'm trying to sort of detach and block and whatever. And it's just like incredibly challenging. And, and so I go to the retreat leader and I was like, Hey, I'm having this experience. It's really challenging. It's like demonic or evil spirits or whatever. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, some of the Buddhist lore talks about that. You really just, you got to sit with it, breathe, do the practice. And like, you'll be fine. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, I don't think that's the case, but I'm going to do it because this is what this person's saying. And another day goes by, I keep going like that. And it just gets worse and worse in the middle of the night, like uh, just more and more of the same. So, and I had left my iPad in my car. So I went the, the last night before I was about, I was just like, I'm ready to go. I need some help from someone here. I go get in my car and I just sit and look at my iPad and just go through all the photos from the past year or two. And I'm just like, okay, that's me. It's like, I'm, I'm feeling so it's like the, the spiritual attack in that is so intense that it's causing me to like doubt who I am mm -hmm. and where I come from and what my history was. And so I'm like, okay, like, and I sit and journal. I'm like, how did I get here? And I write down all the sort of things that are happening in my mind and my past and the ways that it's like making me to feel ungrounded and disconnected from myself. And, um, and I just look, view these images of this, like dancing with some friends. And, um, and so then the next day I just go to the guy and I was just like, man, I gotta get out of here. Like I need, I need some support. And I was like, I'm not finding it here. And he was like, the, this is the men's retreat, um, kind of dormitory leader. And he like looks at me and he's just like, Chris, it's not like there's a war for your soul going on here. And like, he literally says that. And it's like, I feel it's like almost like there's this shadow of like darkness around. And, and then he's saying that and I'm like, that's exactly what it feels like is happening. There is a war for my soul going on here. And it was like, wow. in that moment, I'm like acknowledging that there, there actually, I have a soul and it's, there's a war for it. And so the next I leave shortly after that. And then I drive, um, I drive as soon as I have cell phone service again, I like call my friend Travis that I grew up with, who's always been a devout Christian and had like, we've always debate about it through college. And I'd always think that he was like behind the times and all this. And so he, he, um, we talk about it. He kind of talks to me about some prayer stuff and he's like, can I pray for you? And he prays over me. And it was like, when he prayed, it was like this wet blanket of spiritual suffering weight had like it like blasted off of me in that moment it was like this power this authority of christ was there it was like i was free within that like shield of protection wow. it felt like and and like that thing couldn't be there and i was like whoa like and and i was just like i'm i'm done i'm done searching like jesus is true i don't get it i don't get why i don't get how sometimes but uh but it's true. Like he has authority in the spiritual realm and he's love. And, and so I went home and called another cousin who prayed for me. And it's just like, there were these moments where these two people were like, they were um, offering up their prayers and, um, and I was ready to like actually commit to, to Jesus. Wow. And yeah, so it was, there's a little bit more to it. I, I, but, uh, I've been, 
rambling for a minute. <laughs> no, that's incredible. I'm curious about the experience with the demon, literal demon, trying to, you know, the war for your soul at the Vipassana retreat, how the neighbor's house, how that was connected. The Ouija board is when the demon entered your life, which is, this happens to so many people and you get involved in things unknowingly demons enter your life and that this demon how do you interpret the ayahuasca experience that you had where you had the inkling of the neighbor's house? I think that that was the demon taking advantage. It was like, I think that I had been led astray to the point of opening myself up. And at that point was the moment when the devil like pounced. It was like the you know, sort of lion mm-hmm. waiting to devour you. It was like, it was like, that was a moment where the door was open and I had opened my soul in some way to that spirit. And so then, I think that it was trying to sort of come like possess me basically. Mm-hmm. And so it was basically this, it was the feeling of a spiritual being trying to insert itself into my being. Mm. So when that spirit, when that spiritual being, when that demon enters you in that trip, your natural senses and your natural memory connected its source from being somewhere, maybe the neighbor's house is the source of this evil. That was your natural kind of mind interpreting, but the ayahuasca allowed for the demonic attack for the demon to enter you with such force. And then, oh. and then, so you think about that and you think about also how these practices, they, they sort of focus on surrendering to your experience. So whatever's happening, it's meant to happen. It's yep. supposed to be like, that, and you just have to surrender to it, which is ultimately it's a recipe for possession, exactly. for, oppression, for allowing spirits to come in and deceive. Yeah. And once they do, you know, they start, you know, making your life worse and leading you further down that track of like, Oh, you just need to do more work at this, you know, more yoga, more meditation, more crystals. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's so dangerous and so deceptive. And, and the fact that it's all done under the guise of like, this is something good. It's healing. It's good for you. And like, that's, that's how the devil works. Yeah. Tricks you, you know, tricks you with something that's, it's, it's fool's gold looks like gold but it's not yep it seems like it's love it seems like it's abandoning materialism and modern you know the modern ills of society and kind of reaching back with this ancestral wisdom and you know of mother nature and you look at environmentalism and how the environment's being destroyed and you're like we're missing something in the modern eyes and then you know you think that this whole healing journey in the ancient wisdom is somehow like this noble path of love and light Yet at the same time, you know, the fruit of your life, it's not, it's not there. There's a spiritual pride that develops. There's, there's a lost and a confusion. There's a glazed eyes that people have. And they're constantly like, you're, you know, you're doing six hours of yoga meditation a day, but you're meant to do the healing so you can have your day open and free to live and be in peace. Yet your whole day is now adding this six to eight hours of necessary things to even feel good in life at all, or else you feel lost and confused totally. And you actually go down worse. Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden you're, you're surrounded by people that are like, Oh, I need to be like a spiritual teacher or yoga teacher or some sort of meditation leader. Um, because there's this community and this sense of meaning that people get from that. And, uh, yeah. and so then next thing you're spending more money on workshops and retreats and you're going to spiritual centers and yeah, it's, it's wild. Um, video broke up there for a second. Yeah, there. I think the internet broke up there. What were we saying? Um, spending money on workshops. It's just like all of a sudden you're spending your whole life pursuing more and more healing and working in the space and spending money on workshops and feeling you need to learn and grow more. And, um, yeah. You know, and then you look at a lot of like Christian retreats. I look at them in retrospect. I'm like, oh, most of it's like free. You know, you show up at a church, there's people that will heal for, work for, you know, know like pray for know. you. There's retreats that are Incredible. like basically just all cost, whatever the cost of the thing is, like people are doing it. It's like, there's a real, there's a real expression of kindness and, um, compassion and desire to like willingly serve others, yeah. with, you know, without regard for money. That's one of the first things I noticed. The first church service I went to after I gave my life to Christ, I was just so amazed. I'm like, this guy talked about his story a little bit. The pastor, I'm like, man, this guy gave up his whole like business career, all these things. And he's like at this church and we're in like a high school auditorium. It was a, it was pretty solid sized church, but still I was like, how is this even like, there's this big concert almost and everything's free. Like, 
I can't believe this is free. And these guys are going off of like donation that just like blew my mind. And I'm like, literally everybody here is here for free and everybody's welcome. And it's because people are generous and they give and they give anonymously, you know, and they're just like out of their own heart, giving all the new age workshops, 125 bucks, you know, $300 an hour for some of these entity removal people. And like, you're just like, even a group setting workshop costs money. You know, all these things, and yet it's all free here with Christ in church. And that was just yeah. incredible to me. It's crazy. Yeah, I talked to a, a couple of years ago, I talked to a friend that was still in that, that world. And she was like, yeah, this, the woman who was teaching that, the energy healing course, she was like, she kind of told me that she's made over a million dollars last year on energy healing. And I was just like, wow, that's just that's a lot of money. And like all these people are like suffering and they're led deeper down this path of suffering because of that. I'm just that's yeah. so sad. Yeah. I like how uh, the guy who you reached out to is a childhood friend. Tell me about what you thought about him at the time prior, because he's probably just some, you think he's just some kind of square Christian believing this dogmatic stuff. And you're out traveling the world, absorbing all of this spiritual information. You probably feel like he's some, blinded sheep you know yeah and then bam true. he I, has I, the power of christ operating through him yeah. that breaks that whole demon off of yeah. your life yeah yeah so it's yeah like we we were roommates freshman year and sophomore year in college and that was the time i was stepping away and this whole time i'm like he's like being just behind the times he's not yeah behind fun. the times he's, yeah he's stuck in these sort of rules about how he needs to be and, um, yeah. And like, I would try and convert him be like, Oh, I read this thing or I had this experience yeah. with this energy healer. Like you should come out here sometime and try it. Like, you know, it's so powerful. And I'm like trying to sell him on all this stuff and thinking that he's just so closed off. And yeah. He like, and he's often, you know, kindly just questioning me about it and like asking about how it was and, you know, sharing his thoughts at times, but it was always just a kind, caring presence. And we're good friends. We've been good friends, but it was like, there was always this space where he was, you know, trying to insert the gospel when he could, but I was so unreceptive and, you know, reverse was trying to convert him to yeah. new age views. Um, and then he wielded but, the power that was the cure yeah. to your spiritual dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, I think made me feel this sense of divine blessing and providence of like oh this you know does the lord put this person yeah. in my life for this purpose you know or um and the same thing with my cousin she was similar it was like i would always feel like she was like um closed-minded and uh like nice but kind of simple and um mm -hmm. just disconnected from the real world and she just needed to go out and live more and explore and then she would get it she would know like what I, where i was coming from yeah but there's so such sad. a piece about that simplicity the simplicity of the gospel you know the simplicity yeah. of faith yeah of the gospel faith and, and it's just so beautiful honestly yeah and the call to humility and the you know the first will be last and yeah uh, all of the calls to service of that's when true love, that's when God's love shines is when, when people go out of their way and they don't get anything from it. And, mm -hmm. you know, giving anonymously and uh, not letting your right hand, you know, yeah. know what your left hand is doing. And, and that's yeah, when our profound. reward will be great in heaven. Yeah. It's like, you see, you see what true love is. And then you just like, then I look back, I'm like, Oh man, all the counterfeits, all the, the, the fake counterfeit love and the destruction that goes with it, confusion. And yeah, it's real sad. I wanted to finish that story. So I, I um, so I got back and I go, speaking of, you said entity removal person, I went to two people. I was like, let's say there's this entity. And so these people prayed for me and I was like, I need someone that's experienced with entity removal. Mm. And, um, you know, I don't know a whole lot about like Christian faith or deliverance at that point, but I'm starting to like read about it, but I'm like, and surely people in my life, like in this energy world, know about this. And so there's this girl that um, has experience with that, who was in this energy healing program. And I was like, hey, can you help me? And she was like, yeah, like $200 for this session, and like two people. And it's like, so we go and she pulls out this iPad app. And the iPad app has like this way. It's like it's an iPad app that's built to help you with interfacing with the spirit, basically. Mm. And 
it was like she's like okay i'm gonna call in this angels who i work with and so she like opens up to them and she's like kind of allowing herself to be guided in this app and she's talking about yeah like this is what they're saying and so i'm all of a sudden i'm like laying on the floor and she's trying to sort of allow this energy to purge and move and to release this spirit and over the course of like an hour and a half there's all this cathartic like struggle and crying and yelling and stuff and uh and towards the end of that experience i have this moment where it's like there's an image like the energy that's moving turns into like more like this kind of abusive sense of like oh here's an image of like superman or batman and it's like it's almost like jading me on like agging me on to be like oh you're powerful mm. so this is while i'm coming like i'm like jesus is the way and i'm, I'm like i think that these people are gonna be able to help me and so all of a sudden I realize all of the stuff that she's been doing has been following the presence of this energy. All the stuff that the other person's been doing has been following this presence. And at the same time, I'm realizing that that presence is not good and it's tied to that entity. And I was just like, oh no, like these people that I trust that I'm in this community with, I think that they have my best interest and they do like they are trying to help, but they're following a power that is not of God is not good. And so I leave that the next morning I go to another guy who I lived in the same house with, who was, he would travel around the world doing these um, energy channeling experiences where he would channel Archangel Raphael. And so he would call in the spirit and wear this whole white robe thing. And I was like, do you have experience with this? And he's like, yeah, I'm like one of the, you know, top people in this area for this and I do it all the time. And I go and I lay down and he, he's like, okay, let me check with Raphael. And he, whenever he like does this thing and he like moves his hand in a certain way. And he was like, yeah, so he's saying that this being um, was there to lead you, to guide you to a deeper spiritual truth and that your, your soul has um, evolved or not evolved, but basically grown into this deeper level of consciousness that you're like more enlightened now and that it's gone. It's, it's done its job. And it's the same exact experience I had with the girl. I was like, wait a second. Like, I still am aware of some presence here that's not, um, that's not aligned with what he is saying. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, no, he's, that's not a good angel that he's talking to. And in that moment was like, I realized like I'm in so deep. And it's like even the people that I think I'm talking to about Jesus and saying I need help with this, like they are opened up to the to, to um, the spiritual realm in a way that's not aligned with Christ. And so I'm just like grappling. I'm like holding on to prayer and I'm just like, these things aren't it. And, but prayer is, is there. And I'd call my friend or cousin whenever I needed to, to just kind of talk about some stuff and they'd give wisdom around prayer and, and um, reading the Bible and staying in scripture. And then we start talking about baptism. And, and so I go back to pick up a friend that I left at the retreat. I, I come back and bring him back and drop him off. And, um, and I go for this walk where I'm really starting to really like just drop all of the California stuff and uh, the life there, the, all of the practices, everything. And it, it was just this other walk where I just go and I'm praying in this trail nearby my house. And I say like, God, surely, surely all of these paths are saying the same thing. I like, I'm, I'm following you. I want to follow you. Um, I don't get it. Like, sure, how, do, how does that work? And I was like, surely they're all saying the same thing. The moment I say that, like a snake starts to slither across the trail right in front of me. And there's just this sense in my spirit of like, nope, nope, they're not. And like, as much as I want them to, like, they're not. And I keep going down and I'm like, surely this program that's more self-helpy, that's more about authentic communication and projections, surely that's okay to like stay involved with my phone rings at that moment. And it's the, one of the leaders from that program and I go to answer it and there's no one there, but it was just, it was his name phone rings. And I was just like, and then I looked down and there's another snake slithering across the trail. And I'd oh never seen a gosh. snake on this trail for like months. I mean, I, the months that I'd lived there. And so then I'm just like, okay, like, it's time to like, let go of this. It's just like, I'm, I have to take a leap of faith here and trust that there's, that I'm being like guided and led. So I keep walking down this trail and then I notice my attention just keeps drifting up, not drifting. It's almost like being pulled up to this tree. It's a springtime, 20, 
19 and there's buds that are starting to bloom and I look up at the buds and I'm like, okay. And I look down and it's like my attention is being pulled to like look down at the ground and it's like a dead branch on the, on the side of the trail. And it was just like back and forth. And I was like, God, what, what, what is that? And I was like, life, death, life, death. And it was just like back and forth. And it was just so visceral and so true. And I was just like, okay, like life, I want life. <laughs> like I want that. And I keep walking. And, um, and there's this moment where I come around this corner on this trail where it was like, it was like the blinders of, of holiness, like lifted for a moment. And it was, I look out over the San Francisco Bay and the mountains and there's these flowers and they just start like glowing. And it was just, everything is just brilliant. It was like going from like a old pixelated phone to like 4k high def. And it was just like this moment of like, holy, like, holy God. And was, that was life, life, God, life go hand in hand. Like, and it was so brilliant. And then I, I was just like, all right, like I'm God, I'm yours. Um, and I kept walking and, um, and then there was this kind of leading of the same way it was like pointing me externally to life in this tree and death and this branch on the ground. It was the same thing internally. And it was like, it was me like walking down this path. And then it was this internal, um, I don't know, demonic force, I guess you could say, it was like that wanted to go the complete opposite direction. It was just like, it showed me that in the same way in the spirit. And it was just like, there's a force here that's been working on me with me that wants to go the complete opposite direction of God, mm -hmm. of faith, of Christ. And so I get home and I call my mom and I was like, mom, I need to be like baptized. Wow. And, and uh, she puts me in touch with the pastor and I talked to her and the, as a Methodist church and, um, and she's like, yeah, come, come on. So I like book the next flight out, fly home. I like, as soon as I make that decision, it's like, it like feels like there's this spiritual like cloud and I'm just like walking through sludge wow. basically to get to the car and pack all my stuff up and talk, toss it in the car and I drive straight to the airport park and just fly back. And my cousin meets me in the morning get baptized in the lake and um yeah and it was and then the, i talked to the pastor and she's like well we have a record like you were baptized when you were like 10 at the church and i was like wow like i didn't even it was like totally just you didn't lost, remember lost my mind. I didn't even remember i did remember when she told me that i think i was in such an out of sorts place yeah yeah uh, and um and i just sometimes i wonder about how much of a mark that leaves on my soul to like to like God, God's there and he's, yeah. you know, the door is open for God. There's also a door that's open for the devil. And there's just a lot, there's the spiritual battle that I was in for you know, decades. Wow. And it culminated in this like call home. It's just like, Hey, like prodigal son moment of like, you, you, you went too far. You made a bunch of mistakes, but like, Hey, I'm here. I love you. And like, so I got baptized and like that, that was the beginning of like weeks of spiritual warfare, of, like real like battle of like, listening. I started, I just listened to praise music, like nonstop. And sometimes I listened to it and I would just hear like demonic, like voices, like kill yourself and stuff like that. And it was just like this moment of like, I'm rebuking, I'm rejecting, I'm um, just praying against all of them. I threw, I threw out everything related to new age, Buddhist, Hindu, anything, but it was, it was a path of closing doors and being sanctified. And, and, uh, you know, there's not much of that anymore, but every now and then there's still, there's still sanctification happening. There's still a thorn in my side around the ways that I opened up to that. And I just, I just pray that they'll be used to like help people that are doing the same things that I did. Yeah. That's incredible. And like the experience you're on the trail, it just made me think about so many people who take psychedelics want an experience like that. Yeah. You're not on psychedelics. You're not on that at all. You're seeking Jesus. You're seeking God. Yeah. And that, that vision, that truth that is so immediately, you know, imprinted onto you about life, death, God, the nature of God, like that was why I took psychedelics to have a moment like that. Yet the moment I had that wasn't on any sort of psychedelic at all. Yeah. It was seeking yeah. God through Jesus Christ, through the Bible. 
And like yeah. people think that there's Christianity so dry and it's like, oh, the only spiritual visions you're going to get are on psychedelics or doing this new age stuff. Not true at all. Yeah. Not true at all. Even yeah. when you read the Bible, it's not true at all. You can see in the spirit, you're called to walk in the spirit. The spiritual realm is very real. And, and those experiences are not just for new age, psychedelic, spiritual stuff. Not even close. Yeah. And, but God will give them to, to you, I think, judiciously mm -hmm. if you need them. And like, you know, he also says like with Thomas, like, you know, better to believe and not have to see. Exactly. But like, you know, if you need to see, here's my hand. Here's the hole. Like I died. I'm back. I live. And uh, yeah. And then I think, yeah, the book of Revelation, John, and the, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day and the whole vision comes, the book of Ezekiel, like Paul taken up into the third heaven. Like yeah. the Bible is very spiritual. Walking with Jesus is extremely spiritual and it's the most fulfilling and it's the most fruitful and it's the most, it's like even the Hindu philosophy and, and yoga and Buddhism, there's a, there's a desire to reach compassion and love and righteousness. But the perfect standard of righteousness because as you see it okay you're trying to be loving compassionate but how do i what about the projection do i just cut away from my family how does this all integrate there are there are holes there are things that dots that don't connect because it's not the perfect standard of righteousness but that perfect standard is in christ and god yeah. is love and god is perfectly holy and the word of god the bible is perfect righteousness and that's the answer the others that have a little 90 percent, you know they preach love and compassion for all living things there's very noble things about it but that 10 percent, that five percent that that is untruth you don't want that you want the hundred percent jesus christ is the way the truth and the life you know and that's like that's such an important thing for people to understand is that not everything you were in is 100 percent evil but Satan uses that 90% compassion, love, virtue to keep you in that. So yeah. then you're going down the path of death, the path of, you know, not placing your faith and living with Jesus and believing in him because you're deceived by this 90% good when 100% of what you want is in Jesus. The love, yeah. the healing, and the righteousness. If you're truly wanting to be a repentant, good person, follow Christ. Yeah, like I can't like he's you know the Lord says my sheep will know my voice and like there's there's truth to that and there's you know peace like uh, life abundant like he says all these things about the authority like every knee will bow to his mm -hmm. uh, reign to his authority and and it's true and when I when I experienced that truth it was so real and so convicting and also so loving mm -hmm. and so it's like that it's like the truth that so many people want that's freedom that's freedom and there's freedom in christ there's freedom to walk a good life to love your neighbor to like serve others the meaning that comes with it like yeah. the call to the gospel like all of these things that like the the false fruits that are offered in hinduism and new ageism like they all you all, you get real fruit like you get real blessing like you get to bless others uh through god like with god and, yeah and like what better way of living life is there to do it like hand in hand with the creator of the universe exactly. like you know like and not to be like trying to live up to some idea that i am the creator like what how does that even work yeah, I know. like i am god you are god like what, yeah. so what we, we created the world we created the universe we created ourselves and our souls it's just such confusing junk and then and if you don't believe that you're just not ascended enough and your mind isn't detached enough and there's all these justified excuses that come with it but really like you just need to abandon that immediately you're not god and you know that inherently you know that inherently yeah. and if you genuinely want to be a good person and you genuinely want to repent christ is the one that you want to follow like reading the bible and reading the words of christ after reading all of the things of Buddhism, the Eightfold Path, the Noble, Dharma, Karma, all the different things of Eastern spirituality, I'm like, man, these parables convey such a deep sense of like righteousness of like, it almost makes me want to cry about like how being a good person and what it means and the examples that he gives and like how much love there is. And, you know, Jesus came to, to serve, not to be served and just the embodiment of that was more powerful as I began to dive into the to the word than all the other stuff I read about the other paths of spirituality, you know? Yeah. And that's what's up. Many people, like you didn't even go into the Bible. I didn't really even go into the Bible in my new age pursuits. Yet when people yeah. do, it changes things.
but the devil does not want you to get into the Bible. He wants you to make it think it's dry, makes you, you know, it's just outdated. It's, you know, it's all been misinterpreted. And in the Council of Nasai, they change it. You're not going to get anything from the Bible. It's not true. Yeah. Just read the words yeah. of Christ. Like, yeah. just read the, the Bible. All the lies. Man, I have a story with that. It was the the month or the, maybe two months before I went to Thailand and then India. I was at the a family vacation. My uncle was there, the dad of my cousin, who's a believer. And I was debating with him about the world. And he was asking what I was up to. And I was like, you know, this is this is the spiritual pursuit I'm on. And he was like, he was really downplaying a lot of it. And I was so frustrated with him. I was just like, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get me. And then we were in the car on the way back to the house. And he was just like, Chris, have you even read the Bible? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. And I was just like, I was taken aback. Cause I was like, I haven't, I haven't read the Bible. And he was like, well, don't, he was like, don't talk to me about the Bible until you've read the whole thing. <laughs> just like, I was like, wow, that's good. And I look back and then, you know, months later, I'm having this experience where Jesus, as Jesus is like, Hey, read the Bible. And it's just, wow. It was this moment of realizing my own arrogance. And, you know, I think that's exactly where the devil wants people to be. He, want, he wants to build this hedge of disbelief yep. and judgment and create communities where everyone's like, oh, the Bible, sin, you know, it's anti-gay, it's anti-this, yep. it's anti-that. And it's, you know, it's just a thing of the past. It's associated with closed-mindedness. And it's where you just automatically write it off, even if you haven't even read it. You haven't even looked at it. You haven't even considered Literally. looking at it. You just read A Course in Miracles where they tried to quote some of the Bible and say that it really means this. And then you think that the Bible has been solved. And then you think that yeah. you know it. And then every person that believes it just doesn't know what you read in A Course in Miracles or, you know, other books, you know, and uh, it's it's just to write it off. But the truth is that it's it's the only Jesus Christ is the only way. And when you read his words and the historical veracity of the Bible is far superior than all these other texts that people read in the occultic kind of Eastern spiritualities as well. Like even yeah. Buddha's uh, uh, teachings, he told his people after he ha reached enlightenment and then they taught others, but it's like, we don't have as much historical verifiable evidence that we found our facts of history that we teach in school. Many times the emperors we learn about in school have less historical yeah. support than the actual, the life and the words of Jesus Christ. Yet when you read his words, you cannot get behind, you cannot, dodge the fact that he said i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by me literally yeah. but through him and then in acts there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved you, you, you know all up until you realizing jesus is the way was that one thing like but surely everything must go to a you know to godhood to the source to the brahman consciousness you know to nirvana surely jesus might have just been touching on no he wasn't he literally said i am the way the truth and the life and there are false prophets there are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing who are out there and they're sowing doctrine the leaven of the pharisees was hypocrisy but paul says be careful of those who are sowing doctrine contrary to Christ as Savior. And in, in the epistles of John, test the spirits, those who are false prophets, whether they believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you know, the Messiah, the God incarnate came in the flesh. There's no other person on earth who is God incarnated. It's only Jesus Christ. You don't reach Godhood. You don't reach that. None of that exists. You're a created being and you're meant to be in relationship with your creator. These core doctrines are so necessary when you come out of the spiritualities that that you and I came out of. Yeah. Yeah. I think anybody says like, you'll know them by their fruits. And like, I look back and I'm like, man, what's the fruit of all this? So say it's a woman's making a million dollars off of a whole bunch of people that are like direly in need of like spiritual support. Um, there's relationships that are broken up. There's people cheating on each other. There's people exploring polyamory. Yeah. There's, oh. and it's just like, people are like running out of money, like living, like, quitting like good jobs like leaving family yeah. and it's just like what's what's the fruit of like that like doing drugs random drugs from you know snorting stuff injecting poisons into their yeah. bodies to have experiences like and it's just like what what's the fruit of that like you know you you work more you spend more money your relationships deteriorate and you end up surrounding yourself with a bunch of people that are in the same spiritual hole it's like mm -hmm. that's like the, that's there's no fruit there 
Wow. And, and at the same time, like God's law is written on our hearts and we have, you know, there is a desire to pursue justice and goodness and peace. And I think that's where so many people like, you know, they, they feel that call to like goodness and moral order and, and, um, yeah, but get deceived into not actually like listening to the movement of the Holy spirit and, and other ways that God's working around them. Yeah. And there's so much peace and comfort when you're walking in righteousness. Like even after immediately after I was saved and I received the Holy spirit and I was just weeping in God's love and his forgiveness, yet my guilt. And I literally felt my guilt for all these things I did that I didn't even realize were bad until I realized the holiness of God, the nature of God and where I didn't align. And I knew he was forgiving me immediately, but there was a guilt at the exact same time. And I was like, I knew from that day, I'm like, I don't want to have sex with any single woman until it's my wife on, on wedding night. You know, like that was just immediately in me. And then you look at the societal implica implications of that. And if society followed that and how much better off society would be yeah. with parents that love each other, that are in a marriage bond, that start their family, children born, no abortions. Because you look at many of the people and I would have dreams literally weeks after of babies being thrown into the wall with like strippers and all this stuff. And I woke up nauseous, like the most graphic dream. Yet the immediate thing was abortion and casual sex. What I thought was cool going to college wanting and like. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, it just all became clear. And it was like, the righteousness of God is so beautiful. And there's so much peace and comfort yes. and love when you walk in that, in all of yeah. the world, you know? Yeah, I had I had a similar experience with like going into sort of living a, um, a sexually moral life after coming to faith and just being like, oh man. I was so deceived. And then you look around, it's everywhere, everywhere you look in society and the world and the media and yep. the movies. And, and then you, and then I'm seeing like Ouija boards all of a sudden in like Disney films and yep. it's like, Oh, it's just this fun game. And then you're seeing like the sort of political agendas around sexualization and, and transgender and mm -hmm. the confusion that that causes. And also and it's just like, Oh no. And it's just like the, a recognition of the fallen world and at the same time having the peace and the joy and the relationship with God. And, it, and so it's like, that's a, I'd be interested to hear how you, I don't know if that rings any bells for you, but it's just like the sense of like, oh, I'm standing on the right side of the aisle. I'm standing on the, the firm foundation, the cornerstone, those the rock. And at the same time, now I can actually help people yeah. I can actually serve I can actually be useful in the kingdom but man is the world fallen man is it broken like mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't you know i thought the world was growing in like better ways where people are getting more free because they can choose all these things that they want on their own terms mm -hmm. yeah yeah i literally felt that and and the bible even says the kingdom of god is of righteousness joy and peace when you're mm -hmm. you know walking in that perspective of the kingdom it's there's righteousness, which is doing the right thing. Like immediately I would start driving better. Immediately I would mm -hmm. start like small things in my life and my like character. And I would just notice <laughs> not righteous things in my character, exaggeration, lies that I would say. And after I'm like, what the heck? And you know, I'm, yeah. and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. When you lean into God and you repent and you seek his power that empowers you in those situations where your programming of unrighteousness gets unraveled and you begin to get renewed in the spirit of your mind, as the Bible says, you get renewed in your mind and you start downloading God's software. Like you start downloading software of righteousness and of good works and you're an instrument and a vessel for righteousness. And the more you do that, the closer you feel and you, you, you experience what it means to walk with God and to like live with God. And like, you know, the Bible talks about Enoch after 65 years, it says he began to walk with God and then he gets taken up. He actually didn't even die. Like, what does it mean to walk with God? And he was a scribe of righteousness, a teacher of righteousness. And I, I think he was the great grandfather of Noah or great, great, great grandfather of Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Like they genuinely lived with the creator and we can live with him today. And it, and it aligns with the joy and the love and the righteousness. And then you see the world for what it is. And then you see the, the lack of fulfillment in that. 
It's not fulfilling a casual sex lifestyle. It's not fulfilling believing that somebody who's chopping off their genitals is, is doing something that's good for them. You have a heart for actually help the person. You know, there is a thing called gender dysphoria and that person is seeking, that person has pain and their confusion about their identity. And you're not some evil person for believing they should not chop off their biologically given sexual reproductive organs. Like it's just, it becomes clear. And it's not that you have less love. You, you have more of a, of a desire for them to, to, to live in that state that you're living in, which is just pure joy and freedom with God. And when you're aligned with the truth and, you know, as he says, those who are of the truth, hear my voice. If you're seeking truth and you're living by truth and you're adhering to truth, you begin to naturally hear the voice of, of God, of Jesus Christ, who is the truth, you know? Yeah. And life yeah. is the best God, that way. And it, mean, and it doesn't mean there's not suffering and there's not hardship, but it means there's always a, there's always a hand there to, 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 to like lift you up, to say, Hey, like, let me show you a different perspective on what you're going through right now. Mm -hmm. And like, exactly. And yeah, it's, it's just such a surprise that like everything I was looking for in enlightenment was, was there in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that you can it live a is. great life and still walk yeah, with and, the creator and not have to go to a mountaintop, you know, all in, in yeah, and then, you know, get away from your family. Yeah. And then I move home and I meet like the girl in my dreams, like nine months later, all of a sudden, you know, and like, and it's great and it's holy and it's, it's blessed. And like, yeah, it's just the way that, you know, God says, um, ask and it will be given or like he, how what's that? He blesses. Give all things to those who seek him. Oh, what's the, what's that scripture? Can you uh, does that come to mind? Ask uh, and you shall receive. Knock and it'll be open to you. And no, not that. Well, that one, that one also. The, I mean, I where he, like, the loving father gives. He's not going to give you a stone, but he's who like a yeah, earthly he, father gives the great gifts to his children. Imagine God. Yeah, yeah. You gonna give your he, your kid asks for a bread, and you gonna give him a rock yeah. or a snake or something. Um, but there's a, there's another one I'm thinking of. I'll have to I'll have to look it up later. Yeah, but, yeah. So oh, basically, he blesses his children, and, and you know, when you're living for his pleasure and his righteousness, he makes your way straight. He makes your path straight. And I've seen that, and oh you know, man, I want that for everyone. Amen. Amen. So, Chris, this has been incredible. Your story. I think what has it been? You know, two hours here, and I know you know. <laughs> This is a power. This is a powerful story for people who are not only going through this, but coming out of it and wanting to understand maybe people in their life who are in it right now. And, and is there anything that you kind of want to to touch on as like somebody who might be going through it or coming out of it? Because those are kind of the people who come out of it. I receive a lot of messages from them on like, how do I? you know, get free from everything I was in and like the demonic attacks that you went through that I went through and, um, just any final kind of words and encouragement that you might have for, for somebody that God has led to this video. I, I think if you're exploring, like if you're considering Jesus, I think it's like, like knock at, like the Bible says, like knock and the door will be answered. It'll be open to you. So like ask God, like ask God if he's real, like talk to him, like he's there, like this person that, you know, the Godhead, he, he knows everything about you and, and he's there and his voice comes with peace and truth. And, um, yeah, so I'd say if you're, if you're seeking, like, just give it a try. If you're going to try everything else, like try God, try Jesus, try the Bible, like read, read the whole thing, like ask God about it while you're doing it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and do it with an open mind and open heart. Um, I think if you're, if you're coming out of it, um, yeah, I would say like, be prepared for a spiritual battle and like, know that that's in a lot of ways, that's proof of God. Like that, that when you stake your claim on Jesus, like usually it means that demons aren't going to like play this bliss game or this spiritual healing game anymore, where it's just like, you get to feel good and have this bliss and feel like you're on this mystical journey. And, and, um, you know, I think my experience is like you, when you say Jesus is the way that that's when the demons come out and say, you know, okay, you're in, you're a stated enemy now. Yep. And that's when the deception comes and the lies and the, 
um, the real attack. And, and just to know that stay in scripture and really importantly, stay with other believers, like get in a church, find a men's group mm-hmm. or women's group, find people that have prophetic gifts and uh, prayer groups where people are there and, and lifting up the Lord and lifting up testimonies and lifting up the word and, and get in that space and try and spend as much time as in it as you can, as you, um, you know, your soul kind of has to land on the cornerstone that is Christ. And, um, and, you know, so at the basic level, I would say that I would say, don't believe the lies, like trust that like lies, lies can come into your mind from outside and it can be easy to believe them. And if you start believing them, you'll start to feel more frantic, more chaotic, more anxiety. So if you, if you test the spirits, both for like, are they acknowledging Christ? Also, what's the quality of the spirit? So are you feeling more anxious? Are you feeling more uh, frantic, chaotic, confused? That's, that's always not of God. So if you're sitting there and you're coming out of, um, coming out of some of these practices, if it feels like frantic anxiety and confusion, don't believe it. No matter what the lie is, it might even be saying, oh, like something that sounds like scripture, the same way the devil did this to Jesus while he was in the desert. Um, you have the authority of Christ in you as you come to faith, as you, um, as the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your soul, in your house. Um, yeah, so, so use that and stand on it. And with that, like get rid of everything that, um, that is tied to idol worship, that is tied to other religious practices, that's tied to um, spirits or entities. Um, those things can open doors. And the, when doors are open, you, you'll have more spiritual attack. So, and there's lots of YouTube videos on that. I mean, I searched a ton of those right when I was coming to faith. And there's a lot of guidance that people give on just getting rid of everything. And, you know, if you find a community of believers, ask them to come over and pray and ask for any any um, wisdom on things to, to keep or get rid of. Um, ask them to pray over your space, um, to cancel any contracts, any open doors, closed doors, um, to really just stake uh, the claim of the Holy Spirit over your life and your space, your vehicles, your relationships. It's really just lifting everything up in your life to the Lord and asking him to, to um, well, he will. Just when you lift it up to him, he'll He'll take it with you and he'll He'll bless um, he'll bless you. That's what he does. So mm. I think that's Amen. what I'd say. That's so good. That's so good, Chris. And is there anything where if people want to connect more with you or uh, follow you anywhere, is there any kind of links you'd like them to mention for them to go to? I, mean, for, for now, I think the, I have a recording of this testimony that's on YouTube. Uh, if you just type in Chris Smith testimony, uh, it should come up. Um, and then one of the videos on that channel, I think it's the third one, there's a link to an email list. So my wife and I are looking at ways that we can, um, work in this space for people that are seeking or, um, coming out of seeking, coming into faith, um, just to be, um, supporting resources. And so we're, we're looking at ways of doing that. And so if anyone wants to help with that, please sign up on the email list. We'll get some emails out soon and, and, um, start working in this direction. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. This has been incredible to hear your story and how God has just supernaturally moved and uh, really excited to what he, to see what he continues to do in your life and the people he's going to continue to touch through you. Me too. Thank you so much too, for inviting me over and for sharing like, so, so um, it's so uplifting to meet other people that have had similar experiences. And, and I think it gives such a different, sometimes deeper, but just a different appreciation of God and how he works. When you've, when you've been in some darkness and you see the light, it's just such a good contrast. Mm -hmm. So really nice to share that with you. Amen. Thanks, Chris.